welcome to our services today as we celebrate the fourth Sunday in Lent. The psalm lesson sets the tone for the day. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are those who have become the righteousness of God in the merits of Christ Jesus. Happy are those for whom the forgiveness of God has rolled away the disgrace of former times. Happy is the father at the return of his prodigal son. Happy are we that our sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake. Let us rejoice and be glad. We begin our service this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our liturgy begins on page 94 with confession and forgiveness. We're in the red hymnal today, the red worship hymnal. Please stand if you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin are truly sorry and humbly repent in your compassion forgive us our sins known and unknown things we have done and things we have failed to do turn us again to you and uphold us by your holy spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through jesus christ our savior and our lord amen, amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Our gathering song can be found on page 606, Our Father We Have Wandered, page 606.
Let us pray. God of compassion, you welcome the wayward and you embrace us all with your mercy. By our baptism, clothe us with garments of your grace and feed us at the table of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us share our mission statement found on the back of your bulletin. We are all God's children. God commands us to tell all people that Christ Jesus is Lord. As committed followers of God, we will reach out to all people to teach the gospel and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of our lesson. By celebrating the Passover and eating the produce of the promised land instead of the miraculous manna that had sustained them in the desert, the Israelites symbolically bring their 40 years of wilderness wandering to an end at Gilgal. The first reading is from Joshua 5. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt. And so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Here ends the first reading. Thank you, God. Thank you. 
deserve being held accountable for your own. You deserve God to be the shut of your mouth. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding, who must be fitted with bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy. gathered all he had 
and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up, and I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, Bring out a robe of the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and he is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked him what was going on. He replied, your brother has come home. And your father has killed the fatted calf. Because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came home, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fat calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brothers of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. and mercy from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, the risen and living Christ. Amen. How are you? Good. Well, we're probably low today because the railroad tracks are having trouble. <laughs> I had trouble getting here, Nancy had trouble, and I'm sure Eric probably did too, just because we live on the other side of the tracks. But anyway, 
You live on the other side too, but maybe I live on the wrong side. Well, you've heard that lesson time and time again. The prodigal son, some say the prodigal father. Really doesn't matter, does it? But it's a lesson for all of us today. But I want to start off because with the song, because that's where the crux of everything today is in. Are you happy? Because that's what the psalmist says here. Happy are those whose transgressions, now we don't use that word much, but transgressions means sin. Happy are they whose sins are forgiven. Do you know your sins are forgiven? No matter what you do, they're forgiven. And whose sin is put away. Your sins are forgiven, why? Well, simply because of that cross which is in every church. Your sins are forgiven because God sent his only son into the world because of us, because we disobey. So God said, wait a minute, I love you too much. So he sent his own son down here. And the cross is a representation of that because Jesus was hung on a cross. And when Jesus died, every one of your sins died with Jesus. Past, present, and future. All your sins died when our Lord and Savior was hung on that cross. That should make you happy. You should be smiling, not frowning should make you feel good that God loves you so much to do that for us. And that's why the psalmist is writing here, happy are they whose sins are forgiven. And then the second, happy are they whom the Lord impugns no guilt. And in his spirit there is no guile. That's how much the Lord loves us. And then each one of the lessons, the first reading in Joshua. Here Joshua is once again telling the people, once again the goodness of the Lord. You know, we need to be reminded of the goodness of the Lord because we have short-term memories. Do you concentrate on the goodness in your life or do you concentrate on what is going wrong? Human nature is what? To concentrate on our issues, <laughs> our problems, right? And maybe you're here this morning doing that. Or maybe it's been a week where you're concentrating on your health or something going on financially or something going on with your parents or your children. We're always worried. We're always worried. I love my Lauren so much, but she always is worried. I can't seem to reach her because she doesn't want to release that worry. And I'm not trying to point her out, but uh, she really exemplifies for me this whole concept of worry. Now we all have worries. We all have problems. None of us are exempt. But if we concentrate on those issues, they're only going to get worse because we're giving those issues power. And God says, don't concentrate on the issues. Concentrate on me. And when we do that, when we concentrate on the power of God, things go better for us. And that's what Joshua is trying to say. The same goes true with the second reading, where Paul is once again writing to the Corinthian church. Remember, he wrote not one, but two letters because the Corinthian church was much like the Lutheran church. They liked to complain and grumble. We even heard that word in the lesson, didn't we? Grumbling. And here we are. And he's saying here, human point of view. He's telling those in Corinth, 
Do not regard anyone from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. See, we want Christ to be like us. We want God to be like us, and that's why we don't understand God. Because God is not like us. God created you in the image of God. That means you have the attributes of God. That means that God so much loved you that he wanted to create you in his image. But what we do is we don't follow that image of God. We would rather be our own person. And in 2022, we continue to do that. And I don't see it getting any better. We are isolating ourselves. We are cutting ourselves off from the world. We're cutting ourselves off from each other. We like to be special, and who doesn't? And so we have all of these acronyms for all these groups to separate us. Now, if you've taken out any kind of mortgage or loan lately, which I do a lot, because of my real estate investments and things. One of the things that they ask you, and they always say you don't have to answer these questions, it's a whole page, is questions to separate us. The first one is, what race are you? And there's five or six categories. And one of those is even other. And I didn't know white was a race, did you? White is not a race. They don't say black, they say African American. See how, once again, they want to separate us. And we fall into that. Then the next one is, are you male or female? And now they have a third category, other. Right? Amazing, isn't it? Well, either you're male or female. You were born one or the other. But see, once again, certain people like to say, well, I need it. And so we have to make a category for them. See how we separate ourselves? That's the human point of view, people. We love to separate, and we don't do it. Our leaders usually do it, or the governments do it. Look what's going on in Ukraine. Look what's going on in Russia. More important, look what's going on in your own backyard. Look what's going on in America. Either you're liberal or conservative. And then they have other categories. Are you more liberal or less liberal, more conservative or less conservative? What difference does it make? But see, people like to separate us. People like to put us in boxes. And then the big question, which most people get offended, what religion are you? And most of us don't know how to answer that because we get very frightened when someone says, what kind of religion are you? So most of us will say, well, Christian, to be safe. But see, we even separate each other there because there's 285 different And we're adding more and more every day. So you can't just be Christian. You have to be a certain type of Christian. Right? And yet all faith groups, no matter who you are, believe the same thing. They believe in Almighty God. And rather to, the, to unite around God and the power of God 
we choose from a human point of view to separate ourselves and say, well, I'm Lutheran and I'm proud of it. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. My parents were Lutheran, I'm Lutheran. But where is that even in Scripture? And then we get to the gospel lesson. The favorite lesson of all, right? Favorite lesson of all because it's a wonderful teaching, people, for us today. The teaching that God loves us. Here we are once again. Jesus who is our model, is with tax collectors and sinners. Right? So he's with us. <laughs> We're all sinners. And yet the church officials are upset because why? Jesus is with tax collectors and sinners. And so they're pointing the finger. Right? And saying you shouldn't be doing that you shouldn't be associating with those kind of people sound familiar in 2022 we shouldn't be associating with those immigrants why are we allowing all these immigrants into our country they're taking away from me right And so Jesus, once again, as Jesus always does, tells them a story. It's a parable. It's a story. And he talks about a father and his two sons. Why? Because he knows that this will get them from a human point of view. See, Jesus, God comes down to our level to talk to us about what concerns us. And what concerns us is what? Three. What concerns us is money. Who's going to take care of me when I get old, right? Where am I going to live? Do you know the raising interest rates? What's going to happen? Where's all the oil? Buy an electric car, right? That human point of view. And I can see on your faces, you're all concerned about it. You're all worried about it. Who wouldn't be? Have you filled up your car lately? Four dollars, if you can find four dollars a gallon. Takes fifty dollars to fill my car up. Where's all this headed, right? Worry, right? We're looking towards World War III, worry, right? And it's because once again, we concentrate on the human point of view. And as long as you and I concentrate on that human point of view, we'll be in World War III. But if we concentrate on the power of God, God will transform us. And that's the word today, transformation. God will change us. God will change the world. But I don't think we believe it. And the reason I don't is because we all talk about the humanness, the problems of the world, rather than the power of God. Even our churches talk about that rather than the power of God. What does God say to us in all of this? With God, all things are possible. Elizabeth was not supposed to have a child. You know why? She was old. 90. Can you imagine having a child at, at 90? And I see all the women going, oh my goodness. <laughs> all their eyes got real big. 
I had, been, I had in, my, in my child, it was enough, but at 90, I could hardly breathe. Or what about Mary at 16, who birthed our Lord and Savior? See, with God, and that's where that passage is found, all things are possible. Do you believe that? Do you believe that with the power of God, all things are possible? Because they are people. They are possible. But you have to believe it. You have to pray for the power of God. You have to put the worries of your life behind you. Lay them at the foot of the cross. Turn them over. Transform your lives. Change what you're doing. That's what Lent is all about. We're walking in the wrong direction, people. We have to turn around and walk towards the cross. We've got to walk towards Almighty God. And yet we don't. I share that with my little friend, and she says stuff, and I still work. Now they all have the flu. Every week it's something. Every day. Isn't that life? Is your day the same as you thought it would be? Never. My day never turns out to be the way it, I plan it. But do you begin it with God? Do you begin it with the power of God? Do you pray during the day? Or do you let the worries of the day drive you crazy? Because they will. They did me. And they will you. Because the world is a crazy place. And the reason the world is a crazy place is because of our humanness. We make it crazy. And it's getting crazier and crazier. Because I believe people love the craziness of the world. Why else would you do drugs? Why do people do drugs? You don't know? They're crazy, but why? To, to Feel try. good? They can get out of what? Their reality. If I'm all drugged up, I can't think of anything, right? I just, I'm in euphoria. Right? When my mother died, I was in college. Never drank in my life. Joined a fraternity. And they loved to drink. So I ended up an alcoholic. Why? Because the pain of my loss was so great. I love the person who loved me the most. From a human point of view. And I can understand why God had to take her out of my life and leave my brother, my younger brother. But see, that's the human point of view because I was selfish. I drank all the way through college, all the way into seminary, until the president of the seminary came to me one day and said, Gary, I think you have a problem. So they sent me to rehab. See, that's the power of God. See, they saw something in me that I could not see in myself. I stand before you today because people in my life saw something in me that I did not see in myself.
I stand before you by the grace of God. Forty-six years in pastoral ministry. That's why I never feel worthy to be called your leader, to be called your pastor. It's an awesome responsibility, people, that God has given you. Your lives, I've baptized your children, I've buried your fathers and your mothers. I give each one of you communion by the grace of God, by the power of God. He uses me a broken vessel. He loves you. That's the power of God, people. I will never feel worthy to be your pastor. Ever. It's only by the grace of God. So the Father, the Son comes to the Father in our gospel lesson. And he says, from a human point of view, Father, I want my half of the property. Now put yourself as a parent, and your child comes to you and says, I want half my property. First of all, is it his property? What makes it his property? What even makes him think that it's his property? Because he was born in the family? See our human point of view? I call that stinking thinking. The son is already one of his portion. Well, what does the father do? Does the father argue with him? Does the father have a long discussion? Does the father say, I'm going to go to the lawyer and work this out? Or mediation, or arbitration, or whatever you wanted to say? No, he doesn't. Doesn't at all, does he? He says, okay. So he has the accountant add up everything, and he gives half to his son. Correct? Yes. Yeah, he gives half to the son. Pretty generous, don't you think? Pretty generous that a parent would give half of his wealth to his son already? Why wasn't the parent thinking? Why would he give half of it away? Doesn't he going to need it to run the farm? He could have made all kinds of excuses, but see, that's from a human point of view. God doesn't care. God gives us what we desire, even when we don't desire it. That's how much God cares for us. Do you see that? He gives the son what he asks. So be careful. That's why they always say, be careful of what you ask God. Because God will probably grant your request, even though you don't deserve it. Because you're going to get it, and then you're going to do exactly what the son did. You're going to squander it. How many fortunes have you squandered? Or how many mistakes have you made? How many timeshares have you bought that you regretted? Or investments, right? Because that's from a human point of view. So the sun goes out and does what? Exactly what we would do. He gets drunk, spends all his money on loose living, and then he has nothing. And now he's in need. Sound familiar? Where's all these homeless people coming from, Pastor? Why, you know, why can't they get a job, Pastor? Why can't they do this? Why do we have to help them? Why do we always have to do something? Why can't they take care of themselves, right? Church makes all kinds of excuses not to reach out, to even turn and reject those who are poor and homeless. We want to ask them 101 questions. The fact is they are in need. 
And what does the Lord say to us when we're in need? If you're in need, help that person in need. If you have two cloaks, give them one. If you have more than enough, give a little bit. And yet we don't. So the son finally comes to the realization on his own that I'm in trouble here. And I'm going to go to my father and tell him I have sinned not only against God in heaven, but I have sinned against you, Father. So he heads home. And off in a distance, his father sees him. And what does his father do? Does the father condemn him? Does the father point his hand? Does the father yell at him? Does the father do anything but run to him? The father runs to him. He doesn't run to the father. The father runs to him. Your father runs to you people because God loves you. And he says, oh, so happy to see you. And he hugs him and he kisses him. After he's done all that, his father hugs him and his father kisses him. And what does he say to his slaves? Put sandals on his feet, find the finest robe, kill the fatted calf, we're gonna celebrate for my son was what? Lost and now is found. My son has come home. My son has realized how much I love him. That doesn't end there, does it? We seem to forget about the older brother. Right? We seem to forget about us. Wait a minute, Father. I've done everything you've asked me. I've come to church. I've contributed. I go to visit the homeless. I do prison ministry. I do everything. I play the organ for over 70 years. I've done everything that you've asked of me, Father. And yet, you would never even give me a little pig to celebrate with my friends. Shame, shame, shame on you, Father. Do you see the human view here? When's the last time you felt slighted in the family? I know brothers and sisters don't even talk to each other. I know families that don't even get along. I know husbands and wives that just live together because it's financially safe, even though they hate each other. They have their own bedrooms. What a way to live, right? What a way to live. But what does his father say to his son that comes and says this to him? What does the father say? Son, I've always loved you. And I always will. But this son here was lost. And now he is found. Are you lost? If you are, you can be found. All we have to do is come to God. And what I want to encourage you to do is stop worrying, stop concentrating on the things of this world. And if you get anything out of this message, transform your lives and turn your will and your life over to God, to the power of God. And I will guarantee you as a follower of God, that you will be blessed. Get out of your head. Get out of your head. And get into your heart. Seven, 
8, 5.
Apostles' Creed, page 105. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We turn our hearts to prayer. The prayers of intercession are found on your bulletin insert. We remember in all our prayers, all those on our prayer list found on your insert this morning. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Jesus formed the disciples in ways of extravagant mercy and profound welcome. Lead your church to be a community marked by forgiveness, hospitality, and celebration. Send us to transform a world plagued by fear and condemnation. Merciful God, receive our prayers. You make the land to produce a harvest that sustains your entire creation. Equip farmers and farm workers who till the soil. Nourish the earth with ample rainfall and abundant sunshine. Heal grounds tainted by pollution or misuse. Merciful God, receive our prayers. Countries are divided and leaders often harbor grudges. Reconcile nations that experience conflict. Act quickly to bring an end to war. Anoint peacemakers trained in the art of diplomacy and foster a spirit of cooperation among political rivals. Merciful God, hear our prayer. Your people cry for help in times of distress. Resolve disagreements among family members. Save those experiencing financial hardship. Hear our prayers for those who are sick or grieving, especially all those on our prayer list. Console us with the promise that everything can become new. Merciful God, receive our prayers. Your love comes to us when a table is set and a feast is prepared. Bless the feeding ministries of this congregation. Bring an end to hunger in our community and around the world. Merciful God, receive our prayers. The one who was dead is alive again. We give thanks for those who have died. Confident and steadfast love surrounds us. Shelter them in your love until we are gathered at your heavenly banquet. Merciful God, we receive our, our prayers. Prayer. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of the world in thee. For the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The offering baskets are before you. On this side is the one for the ELC World Hunger Program. We're trying in the next 40 days to raise $1,000 to feed those around the world that have nothing to eat. On the other side, is our own offering for ourselves to help the lights stay on to pay our salaries and our organists and to take care of our church as you come forward to communion please make your donations and your gifts to god let us pray god of all creation all you have made is good and your love endures forever 
You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be the word, world sign of your gracious presence. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The great thanksgiving is found on page 197. The Lord be with you. With this bread and cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us forth, burning with justice, peace, and love. Come, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places. With earth, 
from all its creatures with sun and moon and stars. We praise you, O God, blessed and holy Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready. Please stand for the blessing. The body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his love and grace and mercy now and forever. Amen. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us all one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We certainly want to thank you for worshiping with us. We know you have a lot of choices to make in today's world, but from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for being here. Prepare yourselves, bow your heads for the benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Amen. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you everlasting and eternal peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 778, Amazing Grace, 778.
just to update you, the church is almost fully completed. I hope you'll look at the cross that's over on the corner of Cyprus and Third. It's totally been repainted and it looks wonderful. So if you'll go by that way, uh, you'll see that. The windows are pretty much completed. We have to have order three additional windows and they will be installed later. We've missed two in the uh, altar room and one in the quilting and storage room. And then that will complete most of the projects for the church. Have a blessed week. God bless you all. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.